May 14th is Porchester's birthday. It is the day it officially became a village, but its creation really began many years earlier when it was just a wide place in the road between the colonial settlements of Rye and Greenwich. We should call those two towns the historical parents of Porchester. I'm going to do my best to take you back to those years, so let's begin at the beginning. In 1660, three English settlers from the Greenwich Colony, John Coe, Peter Disbro, and Thomas Studwell, crossed the Armonk River, which was the southern border of the English colony at Greenwich. We now know that river as the Byram River. They were looking for suitable land for a new settlement and were already familiar with the harbor as a place for good fishing and hunting, as well as trading with the Native Americans. The Byram Harbor would have looked very much like this picture, with salt marshes and a rough trail that would someday become part of the Boston Post Road. The harbor area was not ideal for homesteads. The shore was rocky and marshy, and the land rose sharply into thick forests and uneven terrain. Even the Native Americans used the shores only seasonally. So the settlers traveled another two miles south until they arrived at Menersing Island. Here they negotiated with the local native elder, Shanarok, for the rights to the island, where they created a new settlement they named Hastings. It was one of many such agreements with the tribal elders. In 1665, Hastings merged with the second mainland settlement under the name Rye, pushing the southern border of Fairfield County closer to the Dutch settlement of New Amsterdam. This map shows the locations of some of the very first homesteads in the new colony of Rye. The names of some of those original 41 families are familiar to anyone living in this area today. Purdy, Bloomer, Merritt, Studwell, Lounsbury, Sherwood, Horton, Lyon, Brown, and others. While the new settlement benefited from the established town of Greenwich and increased trade with New Amsterdam, an uneasy peace existed with the natives. This photo depicts a typical native encampment that would have been common along the shore of the Byram River. The Native Americans, who shared the land with anyone who needed it, did not fully understand the colonists' concept of land ownership. Agreements were made and broken. By the early 1700s, many of the native families had been pushed off their ancestral lands with little recourse except to retreat further north away from the shoreline. Remaining tribal members found themselves in the minority with few rights and even less land. It was a story that repeated itself all across young America, usually at a terrible cost to the survival of the Native Americans. While Rye continued to grow, the settlers still avoided the harbor area of Byram. They referred to it as Saw Log Swamp or the Saw Pits, or worse. It was simply the place to cut lumber, using the method that gave the place its name. This illustration shows how the pits allowed men to split logs into boards for homes and barns. Reverend Charles Baird in his book Chronicle of a Border Town, published in 1871, recalls the complaints of Rye settlers hearing the sound of axes from saw pit at all hours of the night. There were only a few roads in use by then. Early land records mention Grace Church Street, Fox Island, and King Street, along with the road to Purchase and the road to Boston. The village was never officially called Saw Pit. That name actually first appears in print only in 1732, nearly 100 years after Rye was settled. Even by then, fewer than a dozen settlers had built crude sheds or shelters like these along the shoreline. This photo, taken at a village restoration, shows the saw pits and shelters used by colonists. We can imagine standing by the river's edge looking back into the hills of early Porchester. Land that had been cleared of trees was now suitable for farming along Byram Ridge, roughly where the King Street is now, and along Hogpen Ridge, now called Ridge Street. In 1753, Benjamin Franklin began mapping the old coastal trails and horse paths accurately and adding mile markers for the new post road, finally putting Saw Pit on the map. Some of the earliest families to actually homestead in Porchester in the early 1700s included the Lyon, Bush, Purdy, Bloomer, Merritt, and Brown families. 
This is the Brown Homestead, which still stands on Browndale Place. Deliverance Brown, from the first Rye settlement, cleared land along King Street for a large farm. The construction date of this house is unknown, but records place Samuel Brown on this property as early as 1733. The Brown family graveyard still remains on Indian Road, and Betsy Brown Road is named for one of the family members. The house remained in the family until the early 1900s. The Bloomer family owned considerable acreage in the area. During the Revolution, Captain Bloomer's forces camped along Sniffins Hill, a name often used to describe the entire area of Saw Pit. Part of that area, along present-day William Street, became known locally as Bloomer Hill, a name that has endured for nearly 250 years. This drawing appears in Reverend Baird's book and shows the hill as seen from the Great Swamp along the Post Road, roughly where the shopping center is now. Captain Bloomer's fate is a matter of some controversy, and his burial place may be in the woods southwest of Ridge Street, land that is known to be part of the Bloomer family property at the time. This is the Thomas Lyon Homestead, which still stands near its original location at the foot of Putnam Avenue in Greenwich. Why is this part of the Porchester story? We have to remember that Rye and Porchester were once part of Fairfield County, so the state line is a modern boundary that divided the farmlands and divided many families such as the Lyons. The Lyon family owned Lyon Point at Liberty Square, where Westchester Avenue ends at the Byroom. John Lyon also owned lands along Peningo Street and King Street, and many acres of land at the top of Glen Avenue and along Ridge Street. It was John Lyon's family that began building boats at Byram Harbor in the later 1700s, creating the lasting association of Porchester with maritime trade. Although the saw pits were long gone by then, the name endured. This is the John Lyon farmhouse. Not the Bush Lion Homestead in Lion Park, but the Lion family house near Highland Avenue on his original farmland. Lion farmland covered much of what is now the village, but was sold off by successive generations as the village grew. This remaining portion of the original farm remained in use until the 1970s when the home was demolished. Many of us fondly remember looking through the fence at the cows and sheep. John and his descendants own so much land in Porchester that it's a wonder the village isn't named for him. One of John Lyon's farm lots would become the grounds of the Porchester Country Club. This is a view of the clubhouse and grounds, a product of the wealth that flowed into Porchester during the Industrial Revolution. In the back are some of the houses at the corner of Park Avenue, still standing. If you never heard of the Country Club, it's because it was gone by 1927. Most of the golf course is now the athletic fields of the high school. The photographer is standing near Newton Avenue and Ridge Street, with Park Avenue and College Avenue in the distance. The new high school would be built on the right, with the main entrance facing the water hazard. We couldn't let that go without a picture of our high school. This, of course, is the home that makes Porchester a historic icon of Westchester County. The Bush Lion Homestead still stands in its original location on King Street in what is now called Lion Park. Abraham Bush was a sea captain who regularly sailed out of saw pit. He married John Lyon's daughter Ruth, an event that joined two of the most prominent saw pit families at the time. The true age of the homestead is unknown and may have been built for John Lyon's sons, but the older parts of the house date to around 1740. The barn served as slave quarters for several generations. This photo was taken around 1900. Here's the house as it appears today in Lion Park. The land is actually part of the Bush property, but Porchester became the owner of the land in a series of probate and tax issues with descendants of the Lyon family. The name Lion Park is certainly appropriate, however, given the enormous influence of the Lyon family on the early growth of Porchester. I hope you get a chance to tour the house and grounds and learn more about these two remarkable families. Here's a rendering of the house as it probably appeared around the time of the Revolution. The house has seen many alterations over the years, but some portions are nearly unchanged. The Bush family in Porchester is not related to President George Bush's family. 
Abraham Bush was the great-grandson of Hendrik Albertson Bosch, a Danish sword maker who had fled to Holland during the Thirty Years' War and eventually settled in the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, now New York City. They changed their name to the more common English spelling when Justice Bosch purchased over 200 acres of farmland along King Street around 1720. The Bush Lion Homestead is one of several pre-revolutionary homes still standing in the area. This 1770 British map is one of the earliest recorded maps of the area, author unknown. It is terribly inaccurate, but it does record the major roads or trails of the time. The word pit is just visible at the center of the map, and someone has penciled in the word saw just above it. Jaeger House is the German word for hunting lodge. America was about to go to war for independence, and this map is all we have to tell us how much of the area was actually settled by then, and it's not much. The dark rectangles are buildings, and there was a cluster of cabins near the Byron Bridge and another cluster near the harbor. Between the saw pits and White Plains is the area called Harrison's Purchase, one of the largest land transactions of the mid-1700s that gave rise to the names of two communities that still exist today. This is the same general area on a map drawn in 1789 to help travelers find the roads that led from New York City to Stratford, Connecticut. This gives us a lot more detail about Saw Pit after the Revolution. At the center, from top to bottom, is the Post Road, now Main Street. Near the top is Byron Bridge into Connecticut, across the Lyon family farmlands. Before that bridge was built, the crossing was known locally as the Upper Going Over, to let travelers know that they would be crossing a river and they should expect to get wet doing so. Below that is the Great Rock, which is mentioned in many land records as it was considered a permanent landmark, even though the rock is actually at the bridge, not as drawn. Below the rock is Bounds Mill on what would become Mill Street. A dam across the Byram created a shallow area that allowed people to cross, known as the lower going over, not to be confused with the upper going over. On the left, the road branches off toward White Plains on the Purchase Road, so we know this is about where Liberty Square is now. The homes of Brush, Bush, and Miller appear in this area. To the right of the main road are the saw pits, so we know they are still there. Below them is the path to Sands Ferry, which landed at a dock at the foot of River Avenue, now Purdy Avenue. From there you could get to Oyster Bay on the north shore of Long Island if weather permitted. Sawpit was certainly a village of its own in every sense of the word and it needed a proper name. In 1837 the name Porchester was officially adopted in a special legislative session at Albany. This 1856 map includes the new village name. The name Porchester reflects its importance as a port in the county of Westchester and all references to the old saw pit name were rejected. Many years later, it was discovered that an old English village bears the name Porchester, and a friendly but completely coincidental association remains to this day. At the lower left is the original colonial settlement of Eastchester, and just below that is sister village Westchester. That village would give its name to the county and also give rise to a great deal of confusion. Today, it is simply Westchester Square in the Bronx. The dawn of the Industrial Revolution changed Porchester significantly. In 1840, German immigrants Augustus and William Abendroth brought their iron working skills to America, building a forge and stove bolt factory along the banks of the Byram. It was the first of many factories to come to the area. You can see Mill Street in the foreground. Some of these buildings still remain. By then, there were about 300 families living in Porchester. Another early industrialist, George William Quintard, was building iron boilers for ships at his factory in New York City. He bought land in Porchester for his country estate that straddled both sides of the Post Road, near the street now named for his daughter, Olivia. This early painting is a view of Porchester from near North Regent and Irving Avenue looking down toward Long Island Sound in the distance. That's Westchester Avenue on the right. The open farmland is part of the W.K. Payton estate, soon to be the Clark estate. Another name that should be very familiar is William Ward. Ward and his New York City partner saw opportunity in the area, 
building a factory first along Byram Falls and Pemberwick, then building a new factory on Midland Avenue adjacent to the train tracks that would serve him well. Eventually, Ward, Comley, Birdsell, and Russell would all have magnificent homes along King Street. Ward's home was a national sensation, being constructed of the revolutionary material we now know as reinforced concrete. He did this after his first home burned to the ground. The home still stands off Comley Avenue on lands that originally fronted on King Street and is now a private residence. By 1851, RB&W was one of the largest manufacturers in the entire New York area and the largest employer in Porchester sometimes including three or four generations from the same families. They manufactured military hardware in both World War I and World War II. The plant closed in 1973 after a devastating fire wiped out the entire operation. The railroad came to Porchester in the 1840s, opening the area to commerce everywhere. The Ernest Simmons Shirt Factory on Westchester Avenue benefited from the new access to points north and south. The original factory still stands, filling nearly an entire block on Westchester Avenue. This is a good time to talk about the railroad. The first single rail arrived in 1845, and by 1849 a pair of tracks linked up several older independent systems. The tracks more or less followed the natural contours of the ground, crossing the Post Road, Westchester Avenue, and North Main Street. The hills and valleys of the village were a challenge for the early locomotives. Low stone arched overpasses at Lower King Street and Willett Avenue near Summerfield Park helped, as did a large built-up ridge to get across the Byram into Connecticut, but improvements were almost immediately proposed. Ground level or grade crossings, including this one in 1880 at A.D. Street to Irving Avenue, were soon dangerously overwhelmed with traffic. The curves, hills, and valleys of the first railroad needed to be made straight and level to improve safety and to allow faster trains. By 1883, the rails had been straightened as much as possible, increased to four tracks, and moved up to 80 feet in some places, lifted onto new overpasses. It was a monumental task. Westchester Avenue and the Post Road were lowered to get under the tracks as far as the high tide mark would allow, but that made headroom very limited. These decisions would affect rail and road access to the Main Street area up to the present time. A new train station was completed by 1895, just west of the old terminal that had stood near A.D. Street. The new station was considered a great public work in 1905, and it still stands today. The old freight yards between the tracks and Pearl Street were reduced in size to allow Broad Street and a grassy park to be created at the new terminal. This is the Firemen's Parade in 1907. The terminal served Porchester for many years, but a lot of people don't know that the New York, New Haven, and Hartford wasn't the only line serving Porchester. The New York, Westchester, and Boston Railroad was an expensive and short-lived attempt to connect the coast area to the Hudson. The new railroad line was called the Westchester, considered one of the most carefully planned but heavily financed and costly systems. The line ended at Porchester with a new railroad station on Broad Street, using two existing siding tracks that dead-ended at the competing New Haven Terminal. Here it is completed and in use around 1934. By 1937 it was bankrupt, and the additional tracks were torn up. But the station is still standing, and in pretty good condition after a few alterations. So happy birthday, Porchester! On May 14, 1868, Porchester was legally and officially incorporated as a village under the name which had been in common use for some time. With incorporation came a new local government and a new sense of identity. This 1868 map shows how concentrated the downtown area had become. Businesses, churches, schools, homes, and new streets were being built almost continuously. The surrounding area still remained farmland except for the earliest housing developments along Westchester Avenue from Smith Street to South Regent Street. On this map, most of those lots are still vacant, but residential construction was already booming. Toward the end of the 1800s, we could claim a real downtown area, complete with a village square, even if it was still dirt roads. 
You may recognize this early village square photo. On the left is Captain Buckley's home along tree-lined Fountain Street. Beyond his house are the homes of Lyon and Bush. Center is Martin's Market, a building that would be replaced with a nearly identical structure that became a new bank. That building still remains today. To the right, of course, is busy North Main Street, now mostly small shops with just a few of the earlier homes remaining. New families to the area included Mosman, Slater, Bent, Ryan, Mosher, Roll House, and others. Wealthy New York families such as Clark, Peyton, Gould, Peck, Wesley, and Park joined the Quintards, building magnificent mansions in Porchester. There were modern hotels downtown, like this one on the corner of A.D. and Fountain Street, now called Lower King Street. This is from 1882. Irving Hall was also called Fair's Opera House, which staged shows grand enough to draw patrons from New York City. Several theaters offered the latest and greatest in entertainment in Porchester. Society newspapers were full of the doings of the local families, from weddings to summer parties to fundraisers for causes of the day. It was something of a golden age for Porchester. This is South Main Street, about 1880, looking toward the square. Proctor was a vaudeville theater mogul with locations all around the Northeast. Several local firehouses were generously and gratefully supported by the residents who are now prosperous enough to construct Our Lady of Mercy, Summerfield Methodist, St. Paul's, and many other churches devoted to the immigrants' needs and traditions. Many of the downtown streets were at least partly paved by now with regular trolley service that provided reliable transportation beyond the village borders. This wonderful bird's eye map was drawn in 1882 and gives a pretty accurate picture of the homes and businesses of the time. The harbor is lined with factories and lumber yards, but the area between South Main Street and the river is still a swamp. That area and the open spaces to the north were the last to get broken up into new homes and streets. A few important families deserve mention here. Edward Barton Wesley's story is a real rags-to-riches story. In 1825, at age 14, he ran away from his home in Leicester, Massachusetts to New York City where he sold sandwiches to business travelers on the early ferries. He listened to their advice and learned the details of how to invest. Through determination and hard work, he managed to accumulate a considerable sum of money. In 1851, he and his friends George Jones and Harry Raymond invested $20,000, nearly every penny they had, in a startup newspaper service. That service was to become the New York Times. By 1853, he purchased land in Porchester to build his estate, Elmont, at the top of this picture on what is now Wesley Avenue. That home still stands today, altered into a small apartment building. His daughter Ida Wesley married Charles Abbott Breck, giving that name to Breckenridge Drive. Their son Samuel Perry Breck, who gave Perry Avenue its name, was killed in World War I, and in his honor, Ida donated a corner of their estate to the village, now known as the War Memorial Park on Westchester Avenue. New York City banker Nicholas Palmer, Jr., purchased a 135-acre tract of land on King Street, probably influenced by family friends the Quintards. Eventually, four large Spanish-style homes stood on the hill they named Alden, with a gatehouse on King Street that remains today. The Palmers were the darlings of New York society. The estate was named by Mrs. Palmer, who traced her family history back to John Alden. One of the original mansions is still in use as administrative offices for the KTI. This is the home of the fabulously wealthy and eccentric Frank W. Savin. Born in 1849 in New York City, he was disinherited at an early age by his worldly sea captain father. Frank developed a talent for getting his own way, often with his fists. Bullying his way into the new financial district on Lower Manhattan, he eventually became one of the earliest investors and a charter member of the New York Stock Exchange. In 1890, he bought part of the former Quintard estate on the post road for his 75-room mansion he called Winchester Hall. His last wife, the former chambermaid, 
inherited the entire $10 million estate, including eight Rolls Royces and 20 servants, upon his death in 1931. She eventually gave control of the home to the Hellenic American Boarding School, which sadly burned down in 1945. The Kennedy School and Burger King now occupy the former estate grounds. It's almost impossible to imagine what the post road must have looked like then, unless you have this photo, of course. Still a dirt road in 1910, but a beautiful way to enter Porchester. This view is from South Regent looking toward town. The entry to the Savin estate is on the left, Olivia Street just beyond that. Savin owned most of the land on the right side as well, which was part of the Quintard estate. Much of the stone wall you see here is still existing. While we're on the post road, let's talk about the hospital. In 1889, 14 local women formed the Ladies' Hospital Association, renting rooms on the second floor of a building at the corner of Merritt and Main, then occupied by Scott's Drug Store. You might remember it as Zemo's Clothing Store. The building is still there. Most of the other buildings are gone. By 1910, the Ladies' Hospital Association had accumulated the funds necessary to construct a dedicated hospital on Abendroth property along the post road at High Street. This building is still there, although nearly completely surrounded by later additions. Porchester by now was truly on the map as a place worth visiting, working, and raising a family. Some of its most beautiful homes, many of which still exist along streets like Irving Avenue here, were built during the Gilded Age of the early 1900s. This is Westchester Avenue around 1910, with Our Lady of Mercy on the left in the distance. On the right is the front of the Congregational Church. This area is all storefronts now, but the back of the steeply roofed Congregational Church can still be seen from the post office parking lot on Irving Avenue, and it is now used as apartments. This is our own Liberty Square, 1929. Gasoline was sold in the corner chemists at the Ryan building for the newfangled machines. They probably complained about the traffic back then too, especially without road markings or stoplights. In 1920, Porchester's favorite company built their new factory on North Main Street. The Roll Candy Company employed over 500 Porchester residents in its heyday. But as America's tastes changed, we were denied the familiar smells of peppermint and butter rum lifesavers in the morning. They kept their offices there until 1984, when the building was saved as a historic landmark and converted to apartments. Porchester has many buildings worthy of civic pride, not just in classics such as the Capitol Theater or the high school, but also in banks and our own famous landmark, the Porchester Post Office. Where does Porchester go from here? It retains many of the strengths that brought it this far. Besides local pride, Porchester has a long history of national pride, with many residents making the ultimate sacrifices in the Revolution, the War of 1812, the Civil War, and both World Wars. Porchester, for its part, dedicated memorial parks to those soldiers, all of which are still well maintained. Our village has grown due to the hard work of our early families. Knowing a little about the people who were willing to take a chance and willing to invest a good part of their savings and lives in Porchester can give us an appreciation for why the village looks the way it does. Porchester, nestled as it is between Greenwich and Rye, offers the first rung on the ladder to success for entrepreneurs and young families who mention its small town attraction as the reason they come here. I hope you'll visit the Porchester Historical Society webpage and join us in our efforts to preserve and promote Porchester's incredible legacy. And please be sure to visit the Porchester Historic Archives on our Facebook page, where most of these photos and hundreds more can be found, and enjoy a more leisurely stroll through Porchester's rich and beautiful history. Happy birthday, Porchester!